Today, with a wide range of feelings, I'm announcing my retirement from basketball. Immense gratitude to everyone, family, friends, teammates, coaches, staff, fans involved in my life in the last 23 years. It's been a fabulous journey, way beyond my wildest dreams. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore beeble. Yesterday we had the point guard tiers. Today we're going to be looking at naturally shooting guards. So welcoming him back to the show to talk about the shooting guard tiers that he has uh, so thoughtfully put together. It is Matt Smith. Ah, Smitty. Welcome back, Matt. Thank you, Josh. How are you? I'm uh, I'm good. Good to uh, good to talk to you again. Of course, we are recording this exactly straight after the point guard tier, so this is all for show because we have just spoken to each other for the last half an hour anyway. But let's get st- talking about these shooting guards, Matt. Um, Michael Bolton's ready. Let's get to it. All right, let's talk shooting guards here. I think it's uh, pretty straightforward who is going to be in tier one with the shoot. Oh, by the way, if you don't know what we're talking about with tiers, go back and listen to the start of the Point Guard Tiers podcast where we discuss all of that. We're just going to bang straight into the players here. Tier one of the shooting guards, it's Jim Harden. Jim Harden, yeah, should not fall out of the top two in any redraft league this season, in my opinion. He and Anthony Davis um, are the two best players in the league then there's a fairly sizable gap to the next group. Um, and yeah, should just see another huge season from, from James Harden. Can I ask you a question? Okay, so to me, it's obvious that it's Davis and Harden in that mm-hmm. top two. To me, it was obvious that Harden was the number one guy last season. And yeah, outside of the last day of the season, he was number one all of last season until Davis overtook him. Why are people in letting Harden fall again this season. Oh, I might take Giannis in the top two. I might take Towns in the top two. It's like I've been saying a lot on the podcast lately, very similar to that you know, that clip on Family Guy, where you can either choose a boat or you can get a mystery box. And Peter's like, who knows what's in the box? It may even be a boat. Like, Giannis <laughs> might become good. He might become as good as James Harden. Yeah. So why not just take James Harden? Like, What is possibly changing for him this I, season that's going to see his numbers drop so much? I, I do not know. Honestly, do not know. Just another incredible season across the board. Doesn't hurt you anywhere. Efficient, the scoring, the threes, the rebounds, the assists, the steals. Um, even we've got him projected like for 0.8 blocks. Like that's insane from shooting guard. Um, there's very, very little injury risk there. Um, and if Davis goes down and misses 20 games, then Harden's the natural number one. So, yeah, I'm. I'm can't answer that question. Maybe people are worried about Carmelo Anthony taking touches, <laughs> but it's it's just not going to be. A, I'm not concerned about that at all. I don't understand. The, and it was same last year. People were shitting themselves over Chris Paul coming. In. I was able to get Harden at like seven and eight in some drafts, and it never made any sense to me. He's going to be doing similar to what he did last season. He's still an animal. He's still a beast. He's going to do all that same stuff. And I could look completely stupid when he goes out there and completely shits the bed. But he has been that good for that long that I just don't see any reasoning to go look. We all love Giannis. We all love Towns. We all want him to take these steps forward. But at this point, they're just not there. They're just not at that 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 spot. Giannis would have to then come become a thirty point per game guy and hit his free throws at eighty five percent and knock in two threes a game. And I'm telling you, those things just aren't happening. And so he's still a level below um, where Harden and Davis sit. And, and it's pretty clear to me. And I, I don't understand wanting to talk yourself into getting someone else. That would, if you got picked two, just take. Whoever's left out of Harden and Davis and be bloody happy about it. Well, here's how good James Harden is based on our projections. You could take Giannis plus Donovan Mitchell and it still wouldn't equal James Harden. Yeah, he just contributes in so many different areas. And he still saw his numbers dip last season and was still that much better than everyone else outside of Anthony Davis. It's really crazy what he's been able to do. So if you've got a top two pick, don't overthink it. If Harden falls to you at three or four or five, please don't overthink yeah. it. Just grab him and, and move on from there and uh, and fill your draft draft out around getting a steal at pick number five. Tier two, Matt, which uh, where are we looking here? Yeah, Victor Oladipo sits on his own there from the Pacers. Um, obviously, most improved player last season. Um, we've already heard that he's in even better condition than he was last season, making considerable strides in his ball handling in particular. Um, so expect him to have another huge season and 
yeah, I like him sort of in that um, late part of the first round, early second, sort of 10 to 15 slot. Um, pretty much a no-brainer. Lock it in. Go for it. He was the 10th ranked player last season. He did fall off a little bit at the end of the season where he was 14th over the last two months months because his three-point shooting went from 37 down to 33. So I guess that's an element of concern. Tyreek also in the picture. While it's not a big deal for Oladipo, I don't think he's the 10th best player coming into the season, as those of you who can see the projections uh, would be aware of. But he's still yeah, pretty strongly in that second tier. And as a guy that you look at at the turn, early second round type of a spot, you know, he was really subsided on huge steal and block numbers. But I guess if those steal numbers come down, because he doubled his steal rate from 1.2 to 2.4. And if that falls down to, say, 1.7, then maybe you're not looking at the 10th best player. Maybe you're looking at the 20th best player. So that's a, that's a significant concern. I do think you have to have that if that steal rate, which was uh, anomalously high, if that doesn't stick up at that level, then uh, a, a real regression could be coming in that rank. So there's an element of risk there with Oladipo, I think. Yeah, but then what about if he is it if his ball handling improves, Mile Turner starts hitting some shots and he goes to five and a half assists yeah. per game and twenty four points hypothetically. Yeah, look, he could easily do that. I think a drop from 2.4 steals to 1.7 is probably more uh, more hurtful than a jump from 4.3 yeah. to 5.5 yeah. assists. But you know, those those things could happen. But that, that's the risk that I see there. Again, those steals went from 1.2 to 2.4 and the blocks went from 0.3 to 0.8. That is such an insane leap in overall value. And that's what took him from 77th to 10th. But if that just falls... 10%, 20%, then there could be some level of concern. But I still do agree with you that he is that second tier guy there. In tier three, we've got a bunch of players, some uh, some guys who are consistently seeming to be in internet battles with each other. Not them, <laughs> but their uh, insane fan base, Matt, which I can uh, put you in a, in that group as well with uh, Donovan Mitchell and Devin Booker alongside Bradley Beal and Drew Holiday in tier three with the shooting guards. Yeah, so sort of these guys were getting into that late second round, early third round. Drew Holiday was a top 20 player last season, um, had a massive increase in his efficiency. I um, think he'll be really, really strong again. Bradley Beal, um, that injury-prone label um, from a few seasons to go seems to have worn off. Um, he's played all but five games in the past two seasons now, got a complete fantasy game suited for any any format. Um, and Devin Booker and Donovan Mitchell seem to be linked at the hip in all discussions. Um, and there'll be a lot of debate over who to draft. Our projections can't split them. I can hardly split them. Um, Mitchell carry, carries a little more hype, so I think he'll probably be drafted earlier. He might even be drafted as early as around 20, whereas Devin Booker may fall into the late 20s. So for a similar type of player, um, you could get a little bit more of a discount there on Devin Booker. Um, yeah, do you have a preference either way out of those two? Well, I'll start by mentioning that in our projections where they currently sit, they are ranked in this order, Holiday, Bill, Mitchell, Booker at 21, 22, 23, and 24. So they're basically all you know, in that same area. Holiday's a little bit higher. If I had to take between Mitchell and Booker, um, I, I, think I'd, I think I'd take Booker. Um, yeah, just maybe just because I'm getting those, I think I'm getting extra assists from him. And I think there's the fourth year from Booker versus second year of, of Mitchell, maybe we see a little bit more of efficiency rise. But honestly, that's when people go, oh, I've got to reach for Mitchell. No, you don't. Like if he goes at 17, oh, bad luck. Get Booker. Yeah. Like just get him yeah. there. And we've got Mitchell at an ADP of 18 and Booker at 24. I've seen Mitchell go as high as 13. That's, that's ridiculous. I don't know why you're doing that. Because if he if you miss him, you can get Holiday or Beal or Mitchell, or no, sorry, or, or Booker in that late second round, early third round area, and they give you similar numbers. I know it's sexy to get a guy uh, like Mitchell because he's he's fun and he he wears uh, jumpers with rookie definitions on them. But in the end, we're looking at guys who are other pr productions going to be there, and you can get other guys in, in that similar spot. Yeah, the one thing I will say about separating these two is the Utah Jazz will likely be sort of still playing for that top that four, maybe top five position in in the in the West. So. Um, maybe a home court advantage there, whereas Devin Booker, I don't expect the Suns to make the playoffs. So, um, yeah, whether Booker does play in those final couple of weeks of the season and how much, that might be the deciding factor for those in head-to-head in -head legs, depending on when your playoffs are. Matt, people are on the Suns Reddit are going to capture that quote of you saying that the Suns aren't going to make the playoffs. They're going to call you anti-timeline. You're going to be you're going to be dis disbarred, uh, excommunicated from the uh, Suns fan base after saying saying it, that. But yeah, they are. They're going to struggle. It's it's not happening. It <laughs> is it is not happening. But um, what? But isn't Kevin Durant coming next year in free agency? Well, this year we had Clint Capella coming. We had. 
Um, LeBron James coming, um, someone else like, yeah. But the Suns aren't playing, aren't pay, uh, <laughs> making the playoffs this season, potentially in 2019, 2020. But yeah, it's not happening this season. The Suns subreddit's ability to gush over Devin Booker and you know, just use it as fuel to get into arguments with everybody, as well as talking about Kevin Durant coming in free agency is equal only to the Bulls subreddit in their masturbation over Larry Markinen's increased muscle mass. It is, uh, it's pretty nauseating to look at. And he's, the uh, next Anthony, he's the next Anthony Davis. He, <laughs> he is, no, he's not the, he's the player in the league with the most potential to be Anthony Davis. Forget about the guys who are actually uh, already in that mold, but yeah, I don't want to get into this. I, I've, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Anyway, um, we're not talking Larry Mark and we're talking these guys who are all sitting in that, uh, in that tier three uh, with, with Drew Holiday, Brad Beal, uh, Devin Booker. Actually, one last thing on Booker, Matt, is Booker yep. injury prone? Uh... I wouldn't. I wouldn't label him as injury prone. I think a lot of the reason he sat last season because the Suns were tanking and they didn't need to play him. I think if they were the player in the playoff hunt, he would have played up with that the thumb injury and hand injury. Um, so I wouldn't label him as as injury prone. No. Yeah, I don't think he is either. But I just want to throw that out there because he did only play fifty four games last season. But I don't think you should be reading a huge amount into that in terms of viewing him for this coming season. Tier four, we've got three guys in this list. You've got Josh Richardson. Nice, Gary! You've got Gary Harris, and you've got CJ McCollum, a couple of my favorites in that group. Um, what are your, what's your take on those guys? Yeah, and there's a there's a sort of a fair gap between um, like Devin Booker and Donovan Mitchell down to Richardson and Gary Harris as yep. well. So um, Josh Richardson, massive last year, should be right around 1.5 threes, 1.5 steals, and a block per game again this season. Um, I think he should be a fairly comfortable top 50 player, similar with Gary Harris, one of the most efficient guards in the game. Um, However, he has missed 40 games over the past two seasons, so that is a concern. Um, CJ McCullen does a lot of what Donovan Mitchell or Devin Booker do, but just at a slightly lower rate. Um, But he does have that durability playing over 80 games in each of the last three seasons. So... um, yeah, a bit of a mix back there. And depending on how you've started, your drafts will probably determine which way you would lean um, if you're looking for a shooting guard in this range. If we tie this into what we talked about yesterday in terms of those point guards in that second round, John Wall, Kyrie Irving, uh, in that sort of a... Uh, I think there's someone else that I'm completely forgetting. And another Chris injury... Paul. Who was it? Chris Paul. Yeah, Chris Paul in that second round range. It feels like you'd be better off getting a shooting guard in that range because then you have that big drop-off to guys like Richardson and Harris later on, and then you can get that point guard in the third round, whether that's you know, Kemba Walker, whether you, you take a flyer on someone like Mike Conley in that type of a range as well. So it is it is interesting to see how that all could uh, potentially, potentially play out and working out where is best to take those guys. As I said, there's risky second round type of players with the point guard spot where you can get more reliable um more reliable shooting guards there where that might run out a little bit later on. So that that's, is important to pay attention to. Interesting with McCollum, we talked about his durability. If we have to remember that this is a guy that in his first two seasons only played 100 combined games with real considerable foot and uh, I think shoulder injuries. So you know, the injury proneness does change pretty considerably or pretty quickly with a lot of different guys, um, and McCullum being one of them. So you know, if as much as someone is durable for these last couple of seasons, the two seasons prior to that, he barely played and had a, a, that broken foot problem, which really limited him as he came out as a uh, as a rookie f- um, in that first couple of seasons. So the, these things do change pretty uh, pretty quickly. Um, let's go on to tier five now. This grouping may seem strange to some people, and I'm thinking there's two people in this group that uh, people will have significantly higher than the other two, but uh, we are, or I in particular, see it a little bit differently. Yeah, it is a strange group with DeMar DeRozan now in San Antonio, Clay Thompson with the Warriors, Lou Williams of the Clippers, and the one we'll discuss is Buddy Heald with the Sacramento Kings. And looking at, at the projections as they stand right now, um, Buddy Heald and Lou Williams are both projected higher than Clay Thompson and DeMar DeRozan, which may surprise a lot of people. Um, so maybe you'd like to maybe just discuss how those projections came out and, um, yeah, DeMar DeRozan, how the impact um, or how his new home in San Antonio will impact his value. 
Well, of course, the difference between these guys is pretty minimal in terms of overall value. And I have to reiterate to people that we, we don't go in or I don't go in and assign these guys in a list and you drag and drop. And I'm going to put Buddy Heald here and I'm going to put these guys here. I don't, I don't go ahead and do that. I just go through and look at everyone's individual numbers and and you know, try and project out how they're going to be. And, and on the surface, DeMar DeRozan's 21 points probably looks better than what I've got Buddy Heald projected at 17 points. But it comes down to a, a few other things. A higher field goal percentage from Bud over DeMar. DeMar DeRozan can help him there. A higher steal rate, which he was you know, improved upon pretty significantly last season, helps him there. More rebounds helps him there. So it's never about, oh, Heald's at, Heald's at 54 and Rosen's at 64, so I have to take Bud Heald. Well, let's have a look at where he actually helps in your team and what your team actually needs at that spot. Do you need those extra you know, one or two rebounds that he might provide? Maybe, maybe not. Do you need an extra half a steal? And steals are one of those things that really do elevate people's value up significantly. And can if you can go from 1.5 to 1.8, that might be 30 spots worth of ranking. So that's why Heald comes out at, at that higher level. Lou Williams you know, comes out at that level because of the high volume scoring and the high volume free throw attempts as well, much like DeMar DeRozan, but he hits them at a higher percentage as well. So that's why he's there. Whereas Clay does you know, probably the best player of this group, or definitely the best player of this group as an on-court guy, but just doesn't provide it. He doesn't get assists. He's a good defender without getting defensive numbers. And that's what we're looking to accumulate here. So I think that Clay suffers a bit of a dip. Now he's uh, rank is at 26 on Yahoo. I want nothing to do with him in that area because as we've talked about, Matt, his biggest strength is threes and we can find that anywhere on the mm-hmm. waiver wire. Lou Williams, I think, drops a bit from last season as well given the uh, return of Avery Bradley, of Milosh, of, of Patrick Beverly and the drafting of Shea. He's not going to play those huge minutes that he was playing. And I think Bud takes a step up and plays some extra minutes this season as long as he can maintain that steal rate. What's your take on, on DeRozan to San Antonio? Because I've seen many people say, oh man, Pop's going to make him better. I just don't see it because I've got to look at it objectively. And you can say Pop is a good coach and he's better than Dwayne Casey and no one would argue with you on that. But I want to look at DeMar DeRozan and where is he going to get better? Is he going to start banging in threes at a high percentage? Is he going to start are you providing a, a positive outcome in the field goal percentage category? Like, Is this going to happen with him? Like, Where is he getting better? Yeah, I, I don't quite see it either. Um, yeah, once again, just looking through his projections, he's only providing a positive contribution in three areas, and that's points, assists, and free throw percentage, which is free throw percentage has always been strong, but the lack of threes and steals have hurt him in the past. Um, so the same with that field goal percentage on on high volume. That's that's um, the killer for him is the yeah. high volume and the low field goal percentage. Yeah, um, and it'll be a contest between to see who can take more mid range shots, him or Lamarcus Aldridge this season. Um, and just on Buddy Hield, we sort of had a bit of a chat about him offline. It's probably worth bringing it online and and how the Kings will use him. I think we both think that he's best used as as a six man. Otherwise, yep. their bench looks terrible. Um, but he still should see sort of 30 minutes a game, I think. He's projected around 50. He shouldn't have to go anywhere near that on draft day. You should be able to get him in the 80s, 90s range for a player with top 50 upside um, is, is huge. His efficiency is really strong, which gives him a boost. And like you said before, the steals as well. So, um, yeah, I'll, that's in looking at it on the surface, you're like, wow, buddy, he'll – you know, ranked 50 to 55, but um, yeah, he's not too dissimilar to um, a Devin Booker or a Donovan Mitchell, just a just a poor man's version, if you like. Well, he's not that far off what Clay Thompson brings you, really. And Clay is going at you know, 27 ADP, and Heald's going at 80. Like I know exactly what I'd rather do. Demar's going at 35, which is an improvement on what he did in Toronto last season. A, I don't think he plays as many minutes in San Antonio, and B, I just think that we saw, especially over the last half of last season, his ability to get to the line actually diminished as you know these guys get older, this stuff does, starts to happen. He's not old, but. Between 24 and 27, there is a difference in, in athleticism, and perhaps those free throw attempts can dip. And while he will clearly score the most points out of this group of guys, DeRozan, it's all about those different areas and how they're valued. And as I said, things like steals, the higher your steal rate gets, it, it does really bump you up pretty significantly in the rankings. That's why I, you know, I hate you know, people I rank these guys. It is very dependent on how you view them. And you don't need to take Buddy higher than Clay or, or Demar, but I'm also not reaching into those first three rounds for either Thompson or DeRozan. If they fall to the 50s, then I'll have a decision on my hands, but yep. it's unlikely they're going to do that. Yeah. The next tier, Matt, we've got tier six. Yep, Tyreek Evans um, now with the Indiana Pacers and Tim Hardaway Jr. with the Knicks. Um, 
I'm off Tyreek Evans this season. I think last season was the perfect storm of health situation opportunity there in Memphis. Um, likely to be the sixth man in the paces. Significant drop in usage, and I just don't trust him to stay healthy for another season. Um, and Tim Hardaway Jr., the Knicks are going to be absolutely desperate for some scoring, especially while Chris Tapps Porzingis is out. Um, and that's going to be a, a huge drain on his field goal percentage. So what are your feelings on Tyreek Evans in particular this season? I'm not actually worried about him in terms of injury. He had that real bad stretch of knee injuries where he had like three surgeries in nine months, but we're talking over two years removed from that now where he hasn't had any knee issues at all. He missed games last year, but that was Memphis's ineptitude rather than an actual injury from Tyreek where they sent him home uh, to be traded, didn't trade him, brought him back for two games and then told him he was out for personal reasons, which was, of course, a load of shit. At the end of the season, he was healthy all year, and yeah, he won't have the same usage. He won't be playing primarily point guard for the Pacers, but their point guards are Darren Collison and Corey Joseph. These are not great players. They are not good players, and Tyreek and Oladipo handling the ball is probably a situation I'd prefer over Collison and Corey Joseph. So I think he's right in that six-man role, back up two, back up one, back up three minutes as well for Tyreek. It won't be as good as last season, but his ADP at 103, I feel pretty good about him beating that number. Do you feel good about him beating that? Uh, he would beat 103, but I'm not. I'm not, you know, expecting top 50 value again this season. Yeah, I don't. That's I, don't for sure. I don't think top 50 is is on the cards for him either. But I do think that he can have you know, a pretty nice uh, type of season. It'd be interesting to see exactly how Indiana does use him. But he should be the guard that's getting the second most minutes behind Oladipo, ahead of Collison and ahead of Joseph. We'll see if they do that. As for Timmy Hardaway, I agree with what you said there. The volume is going to be a problem on the poor field goal percentage, um, but he's going to score, and scoring still is pretty useful in leagues where he could be a 20-point-per-game guy. Just uh, not much else is going to be coming his way, unfortunately. Tier 7, we're getting down to the dregs of the shooting guards. Now, still some interesting players here in this group, though. Yeah, there are and some names we've seen um, probably further up the rankings in previous seasons with Evan Fournier, Zach Levine, um, Bogdan, Bogdan Bogdanovich in his second season, um, and Jeremy Lamb in, in Charlotte now. Um, I have bump, bumped up Bogdan Bogdanovich um, probably from Tier 8 into Tier 7, more so for his upside. Um, last season, there was a stretch there where he was flirting with top 50, top 60 value. Um, I've even said to you, I would probably draft him over Jeremy Lamb. Yep. Um, and you would I, like I think to I probably would as well. That, Josh. You would as well? Yeah, but I think I probably would. Lamb projects out pretty well. But in terms of confidence, is, is he going to play 28 minutes a night or is Borrego going to give Monk minutes? How stable is Lamb going to be in that role? I just don't know at this point. So I've got him at like 28 minutes a night, but he could come in at 24 minutes a night or it could be 29 one day and 21 the next day. I'm not confident in that. Whereas Bogdan, like the King's wing rotation is shit house. So he's going to have to play minutes. He's going to have to play 29, 30, 31 a night. And we know he can improve. He shot the ball excellently as a rookie. That can continue. He gets assists, he gets steals. So even though he projects a little bit lower, my confidence in him in these mid to late round types things, it's it's there. And he also, he also got pretty good upside as well. He's probably got higher upside than Lamb. Yep, so absolutely. even though the projections come out that way, I, I probably would still take Bogdanovich over him. It's why, again, I, and I never like to refer these as rankings because if you ever just print off the projections or pr print off this list and draft draft this list, you're going to lose. Unless you're in a points league, but even then there's an element of nuance in it. But if you're in a category league and you're doing it that way, it, it, that's just not how you should be drafting and you are going to lose. It's like if you just set your, your rankings based on this, put it on auto draft, your team's probably not going to turn out very well. Yeah. And just just on the Hornets, Jeremy Lamb and um, I've got Malik Monk a little bit later on. Do you think there's any sort of chance that Monk might start and they keep Jeremy Lamb in that six-man role? Yeah, I worry about it because that defense will be atrocious with Kemba and Monk in that starting backcourt. And I think Monk as that guy to lead the scoring in the bench unit probably fits a little bit better there. We saw him play some point guard last season. Tony Parker will be doing it this year. I think having Monk alongside Parker and Bridges, two low usage guys at the one and the three, will really help him out. Whereas mm. next to Kemba Walker that fit may be a little bit messy. So I do think that they'll go that way. But as for the minutes, it could be Lamb playing 24 and then Monk playing 28 uh, in that backup role and playing a lot with second unit. So I'm just not sure how that minutes go, but I, just, I do think that Lamb will be the starter there. The other guy you've got in that list is Zach Levine, who... He was flirting with top 50 numbers before he tore, tore his ACL in Minnesota, but there's a couple of things there. A, he's coming back from an ACL. B, he was the third option at best on that team, so wasn't seeing the double teams and the amount of pressure he saw. And he played 37 minutes a night. Now, those things aren't going to be the case in Chicago. He's not playing 37 a night. He's not the third option. 
He probably should be at least the second option behind Markkinen, but he won't be. He'll be jacking up shots. He'll be taking bad options. Uh, he's not a good ball handler. I think he's at significant risk of being overdrafted because uh, I think Zach Levine is a great bloke. I think he's, he's a ripper guy, and I really, really want him to be able to succeed. I just have to look at these things from a numbers point of view and realize that that top 50 number he got to was on really high efficiency in a huge amount of minutes, and I don't think those things are coming back. Yeah, and I have to agree with all those things you've just said. So tier eight, uh, we've got Andrew Wiggins from the Timberwolves, Contavious Caldwell Pope at the Lakers, Eric Gordon, the Rockets, Kent Bazemore with the Hawks, and JJ Redick in Philly. Um, Andrew Wiggins, just an underwhelming fantasy player. Um, only positive contribution is in points. Now, it is hard to find nearly 20 points per game at this point of the draft, but you'll have to be careful to make sure you can take the hit in other areas. Um, KCP, threes and steel sort of guy. Eric Gordon, I'm a bit of an Eric Gordon fan. I love him in head-to-head legs and what he can do. He can just go massive in, in points and threes and put up five rebounds and five assists as well, can catch fire at any time. And when Chris Paul does miss games, Eric Gordon can just That's go the key. Yep. Yeah. When, when uh, Paul's out, his assists skyrocket, his free throw attempts skyrocket, everything goes up and he looks like a top 50 guy and then Paul comes back and he's outside the top 120. So that's yeah. the risk. If you think Paul's going to be out a huge amount of time, then bang, go on. Gordon is great value. But if Paul plays yeah. 75 games, then he's going to just really struggle around that back end, uh, back end zone. Yeah, and Gordon can be that sort of that guy. When Chris Paul is out, he can you know win you oh, yeah. a head-to-head week off his own for a couple of weeks there. So, um, yeah, really like him. And, and JJ Redick... Um, had a pretty good season last year in, in Philly with career guys in points, rebounds, and threes. Not that we're too concerned about JJ Reddick getting rebounds, um, but he's always been strong from the field, elite from the free throw line, um, and just a guy you can plug in. Know he's going to be reliable night in, night out. Won't hurt you. Um, or I was going to say anywhere, but obviously the, the steals and lack of defensive stats. But um, yeah, so anyone maybe after after Gordon who who stands out there for you. Um, Reddick's an interesting one. I think he's going to play fewer minutes this season because of Fultz, who we reference in the Point Guard Tears podcast, that he'll take some of those minutes. Reddick played almost 33 minutes a night, I think, last season, which I think will come down pretty significantly. Did, did the Sixers, have they re-signed Jared Bayless? Uh, he's Doing still it? under contract. He's got one year left. Okay, right. Yep. At uh, $9 million, so that's a, it's a great deal. They'll be looking to get his ass out of there. He's just not going to play uh, most nights. We're going to have Simmons, um, Simmons, Reddick, Fultz, McConnell as the top four guards, I would imagine, on this on this team. Um, and then Simmons pushing up to play some other positions. At times, there's also uh, Landry Shamet and Shake Milton, who, uh, if they can develop some level of shooting, they will see the court ahead of Bayless, but we'll have to wait and see exactly how that all pans out. Kent Bazemore, I just don't think he's very good. He might have an opportunity early on if Lloyd Pierce agrees with me and doesn't think he's very good, which I think he might, then he could fall out of there. And uh, the, the risk of a trade with him is pretty significant, I believe, in that area. Let's go to uh, to tier nine here. People might be a little bit surprised to see Jalen Brown in this area. Matt, um, you, I know you didn't do the projections and I did them, but you know, what's why is uh, Brown not as good a fantasy player as, he's, uh, as his game may suggest on the court? Uh, let me, where is he ranked just out of interest? I'm just trying to scroll through and find him. You'll see him, he's just, just after Reddick, you should see him. Uh, what, what number? Um, well, I've got him about 129 at this point. Oh, geez, that is like. Yeah, and <laughs> the reason is, is the poor free throw shooting. Um, yep. on decent attempts. Now, I think that will improve. It improved over the second half of the year, but he needs to get to 77 or 78% to be break even in that category. And I think that's a big stretch for him to be able to get there. Never a good free throw shooter in college. Hasn't been in his first two seasons in the NBA. And the volume is a concern there. He does not get assists. He doesn't get steals. He doesn't get blocks. And with the return of Kyrie, with the return of Gordon Haywood, someone is going to have to lose usage. And if you talk about that Starting five or proposed starting five in Boston of Kyrie Irving, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Gordon Haywood, and Al Horford. Realistically, Brown should be the fifth offensive option. Now, he probably won't be because Al Horford will cede that to him, but he's not one of the top four offensive options on that team. And his real value was just from scoring points. And if that comes down, along with that poor efficiency and a lack of rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks, then that's why he's not doesn't he's not as good of a fantasy player as what you might expect him to be. Yeah, and in terms of head-to-head legs, who I personally like guys who can go big in one or two categories. He's not going to hit the threes at the same rate of an Eric Gordon or a JJ Reddy. He's not going to steal like KCP. He's not going to get your blocks like Danny Green. So, yeah, how is he going to help your team um, at the end of a, a fantasy week? So, um, 
Yeah, no, he, I agree. he averaged one point six assists per game last year in thirty one minutes. Like that is minuscule. That is very, very bad. That is, yeah, that's, that's a real look. And if he if it was at three assists per game, then you're talking about a guy who is a top one hundred, top ninety sort of a player. But we're looking at yeah, potentially a drop in usage this season. The free throws are a concern. Now, to be fair, over his final eighteen games, he did shoot seventy nine percent from the line. But first seventy eight games in the NBA, sixty nine percent. The next seventy games, sixty four percent. I'll go with those samples over an eighteen games game sample. Plus. He struggled to do it uh, in college as well. Had some, definitely had some big games. And this is the thing: it's the, even if you look at his game log from last season, Matt, when he came back at the end of the season after missing a few games, this is what he does. And the good games stick in people's minds, and the bad ones disappear. First game back, nineteen and two, then seven and five, then twenty-one and five, then four and three, then twenty-four and four, then nine and two, then thirty-two and four, then twelve and two, and then twenty-seven points with one rebound. So it's just on and off, the inconsistency, and that's going to become more of a problem. Add in the fact that he doesn't contribute in those other areas. He's a much better real-life player than he is fantasy contributor. Now, he's in his third season, so anything could change, and he could take big steps up. And I'd be more than happy with taking a flyer on him, but you've got to have a look. And when you look at these guys upside, where will he improve? Well, can the efficiency improve? Yes. Can the the playmaking? Yeah, I'm not so sure about that when there are you know four guys in that starting five who are better playmakers than him. Plus, then you get Rozier and Smart who come off the bench, and if they're sharing the court with him, they're considerably better as well. So that's all the reasons that Brown just isn't as good of a fantasy guy, but someone who gets significantly overrated. I remember talking about it last year when after his first couple of games, people traded uh, Bradley Beal to get Jalen Brown. It was nonsense at the time, and it looks even stupider now. Yep, well said. Uh, Danny Green, can we expect a bit of a bounce back season from him? Um, always yeah, wonder. I think still, so. Uh, flirt with a, a, a triple one, as you like to say. I think he can uh, bounce back a bit. He played with that torn groin last season. He had Popovich for whatever reason. Pop hated him and just refused to play him minutes. Green is one of the best transition defenders in the NBA, and yes, he has taken somewhat of a step back. He can be inconsistent with his shot, but he felt like he was always a scapegoat for Popovich, and if he missed a shot, he'd just get sat for an entire half. I don't think Nick Nurse will be doing that in Toronto. He's not going to be playing 32 a night, but I think he plays more than he did in Toronto, and somewhat of a bounce back could be coming, but you're probably limited upside with Dan Green there. Um, and then final tier, T10, we've got Malik Monk, as we mentioned before, and Hornets. Um, I've got Luke Kennard and Reggie Bullock um, on the same because they're oh, basically their projections in terms of Z score is identical, and Marcus Smart. So we spoke about Monk a little bit before, um, be inter interesting to see how many minutes he gets and and what sort of usage and, and role um, could be a good source of threes for streaming purposes. Oh, yeah. um, and and Marcus Smart, um, it can be tough to find sort of five assists and one and a half steals per game later on or, or off the waiver wire. So um, yeah. That's about it. You've got Kennard and Bullock, who are both 40% three-point shooters as well, so there's value there. It's all going to come down to how the Pistons run that 2-3 rotation. There's Bullock, there's Kennard, there's Stan Johnson, there's Glenn Robinson. So it's all going to depend on how they do it. Could they put Kennard and Bullock out there? I'd love to see that alongside Reggie Jackson, uh, Griffin, and Drummond because those three guys can't really shoot that well, whereas Kennard and Bullock both can. Stan Johnson, not a great shooter. Glenn Robinson, I don't know if he's actually a good shooter or not. We don't. We haven't had enough of a sample to see. So I'd like to see Bullock and Kennard doing that. Whether whether um, Dwayne Casey does that remains to be seen. Kennard, I think, has the highest upside out of that group. Um, yeah, I think he's got the, the path of he plays 30 minutes. He can get assists and rebound and get steals and hit threes and do it all efficiently. So I think he's got pretty significant upside there. But it's going to depend on how Dwayne Casey sees him and what his role is for this coming season. Anything else to add on uh, on these guys, Matty? That's about it, I think, mate. I reckon, so, um, yeah. Who just, just uh, who just missed out in your in your list here? You got uh, Josh the Hitman Hart, uh, not yeah. quite there. Avery Bradley, uh, yes. out, out of there. Rocket Rodney Hood. Yeah, I'm still. I think I might have Hood maybe at the very back end of my um, small forward tiers, but we're still waiting to see what happens there. Um, yeah, then down, we've got down Clark, Waiters missed out. Gary Harris, yeah, each one more is probably a bit more of a small forward. Um, Seth Curry could be an interesting threes guy off the bench as well there in Portland. It's going to be interesting how they use him and Wade Baldwin because Baldwin's looked really, really good lately. Um, yeah, Curry it was fantastic the last time he played in Dallas, but interesting to see if they want to go with some length with the Baldwin or if they go with Curry. They run a three-man guard rotation with CJ, Dame, and Seth, or if they're going to incorporate Wade in there. That's going to be the big thing that's impacting on Curry because if they go three-man, Curry could play 26 a night, and yeah, that's real value. If Baldwin's in there, then he's playing 20 a night. And, and I guess that's the concern with his value. 
Spot on, mate. All right, Matt, where can everyone find you over on the old Twitter machine? On Twitter machine, um, at S-Man Sports. So give me a follow and come and say hello. Go do that. Follow me at RedRock underscore Beeble. Subscribe to this podcast, Apple Play. Oh, sorry, not Apple Play. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Five-star rating, thumbs up, comments. Share it with your friends. You know what to do. Check out Basketball Monster as well. Sign up, become a member, and check out all our great tools and articles over there. Matt, thank you once again. Thanks, Josh. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Manu Ginobili.